the next talk will be uh, the next talk will be uh, from Phil Arasun, and he will talk about uh, complex complexifying the curve two body problem. Thanks, Maureen. So, yeah, first off, I want to thank Sonia and Maureen for inviting me to give this talk. Um, what I'm going to talk about is um, based off some res research Maureen and I both did together last year, and it's an application of that research, so it's particularly nice to be able to advertise that here. So last year, Maureen and I wanted to consider Hamiltonian systems, which are real, but where you complexify everything in sight. You complexify all the variables. So what was once a real symplectic manifold becomes a holomorphic symplectic manifold. And what was once a real Hamiltonian function becomes a holomorphic Hamiltonian function, complex valued. And somewhat, perhaps unsurprisingly, it's not very interesting. What you simply get is what you recognize to be Hamiltonian dynamics, but with the complex numbers replacing the real numbers. However, where we really found something more interesting is when we considered the reverse. What happens if we want to see what different possible real Hamiltonian systems, when complexified, give the same holomorphic Hamiltonian system? And this is somewhat analogous to what we encounter in Lie theory. So let's see if this works. Tap that, tap that. Nope. I will get this, I promise. Okay, Lie algebras. I'm now going to summon a prop. I'm going to show you two distinct real Lie algebras. On the left hand side, we have SO3, and on the right hand side, SL2R. These are both real three dimensional Lie algebras which are non isomorphic. However, if you look at these, oh, sorry, I should say what, what I've just put on the screen, these are the structure matrices for these Lie algebras. And if you look at them, you'll see that they are almost the same were it not for the minus sign over here. This minus sign is what is responsible for these two, these two Lie algebras being non-isomorphic. Wouldn't it be great if you could allow for a complex change of variables because that would allow you to, in fact, identify these two Lie algebras with the following complex change. If I multiply omega 2 and omega 3 by i, that should be a 2, you can see for yourself that the structure matrix, structure matrix on the left hand side becomes the one on the right hand side. Although to do this, I necessarily had to scale by a complex number. So how you would write this is you would say that this real Lie algebra, when complexified, if I allow the complex, if I allow the variables to now be complex, this gives me the same thing as the Lie algebra on the right hand side, which is also complexified. Although as real Lie algebras, they are different. As complex Lie algebras, they are both the same. So in the, in the language of uh, Lie algebras, we would say that SO3 and SL2R are each real forms of the same complex Lie algebra. So the picture is something like this. Here's the big complex Lie algebra. And inside we have two distinct non-isomorphic real forms. Now, what is useful, what is a useful trick in the study of Lie algebras and their representations is the unitary trick by which certain properties of Lie algebras can be deduced by first of all establishing that property on one real form, complexifying to the big Lie algebra, and then restricting attention to a different real form. So um, for example, if I wanted to show useful properties such as 
reducibility of a representation or the Jordan decomposition. Sometimes the easiest way to prove these things for Lie algebras such as SL2R might be to first prove it on SO3, complexify and then restrict attention to a different real form. This example with Lie algebras is itself just a specialization of what you can do on a vector space. Has that worked? Wow, look at that technology. So if I begin with some real vector space V, I can complexify this and obtain the complexification by simply attaching another copy of that vector space, which I call IV, an imaginary part. In slightly more intimidating notation, this complexification can be written as the, the tensor product of the original real vector space with the complex numbers, but in far less intimidating language and equally acceptable, it is just this, this direct sum. The reverse of this, well, notice that when we have this complex vector space here on the right side of the page, we have this decomposition into a real part and, and an imaginary part. And that allows us to kind of define a, a complex conjugation where we fix the real part and we reflect, if you like, the imaginary part. So if we want to reverse this process do the opposite of complexification, what we do is we, we start off with a complex vector space, call it W. And what we need is this notion of complex conjugation, which goes by the name of a real structure, which shall mean a kind of reflection, by which I mean a map R, which is involutive, and I also require it to be conjugate linear. Okay, that's the definition of a, of a real structure, a linear real structure on a complex vector space. And provided that that fixed point set of R is non-empty, let's call that V, that is a real vector space, and the conjugate linear property of R allows us to decompose that space, the full complex vector space W into V, plus IV. Okay, so that's, that's the, the linear story. Uh, notice that if I start with a real vector space and I want to complexify it, there's only one choice for complexification. So in some sense, that's boring. However, if I start with a complex vector space and I wish to find a real structure, you have quite a lot of choice. Another example of this, if we um, specialize this a bit more, is with groups. Oh, what have I done? There we go, no. Groups. Great. If I take a um, complex Lie group, say for example, SL2C, so two by two complex matrices with unit determinant, it also makes sense to describe a real structure on, on such an object. A real structure is again a map R, which satisfies the three following properties. Uh, first of all, it's, it's an involution. Secondly, it's a uh, derivative is everywhere conjugate linear. 
And finally, as soon as we're talking about groups, we should expect it to be a homomorphism. Uh, an example of such a thing, well, for, for exa our example of SL2C, uh, let's say I have a, a matrix Q belonging to this group. I can take, for instance, the inverse of the conjugate transpose. This is definitely an involution. Its derivative is conjugate linear everywhere and it's a homomorphism. So this is an example of a real structure and the fixed point set sort of the real part that lives inside this group is by definition the special unitary group. But that's not the only choice for real structure. You could also have, for instance, uh, let me call it T. I'm going to skip the letter S. Uh, I could just take the, the complex conjugate. A again, that satisfies all of those three conditions. And again, the fixed point set by definition is now the special linear group. Okay. So this, this basic notion of uh, complexifications and real forms for a vector space has these uh, two uh, more advanced cousins. There's, we can define real structures for Lie groups. And in fact, this example that we've just seen for SU2 and SL2R is none other than the group version of the very first example. So in the very first example, SO3 is, of course, SU2 as a Lie algebra. And so in this first slide, we've seen that these two real Lie algebras are both real forms of the same complex Lie algebra. And here is the, the, the group theoretic result down here. Of course, why, why stop at groups? Um, there's no reason why you can't go even further. And do this for manifolds in general, or well, complex manifolds anyway. In this case, you start with a complex manifold. And again, we require a complex conjugate, a, in, an involution. Uh, this involution need only satisfy two of the properties that are, are given above. That is in particular, it needs to be an involution and it needs to be, its derivative needs to be conjugate linear everywhere. Obviously we don't require it to be a homomorphism because it's not a group in the first place. So an example of such a thing, well, we, we, can, we can take the same complex manifold as before which just so happens to be a Lie group as well. However, this time we don't need to look for real structures which are homomorphisms. So now I will use the letter S. I could, for instance, just take the conjugate transpose. I should say, if you've been listening to this talk and expecting to hear about the two body problem and you're confused that you've not heard about it yet, it will come. Uh, we just need to wade through this bit first. So I can take the conjugate transpose of a matrix, and that is clearly not a homomorphism. It swaps things around in the wrong direction. But it's still an involution, and it's still the derivative is conjugate linear everywhere. So it is an example of a real structure. And what will this fixed point set look like? Well, well we can see that it's, it's, it's going to be Hermitian two by two matrices with determinant one. But I want to, a better way of understanding what that actually looks like. So I'm going to pull out another one of my props. There we go. Here's a handy way of denoting a two by two complex matrix. Here you V, W, and Z are complex numbers. And the reason why this is a sneaky way of writing a matrix is you notice that the determinant is this handy expression. 
Okay. In particular, if I'm looking at the group SL2C where the determinant is equal to one, then what I actually have here is I have what looks to be a sphere, sphere, but well, it's actually com it's the complex sphere, which I will denote CS3. Okay. Now, in terms of these variables u, v, w, and z, the real structure S takes these, and you can, if you're all looking, you can probably see this for yourself. It takes the complex conjugate of these. However, it negates the, the last three. Okay. What this means is, is if the, the, the fixed point set of S is the following. T, X, Y, and Z are real numbers. And this condition that the determinant be equal to one is the following, which we recognize to be the usual description of hyperbolic three space, or at least it's, it's two connected components of it anyway, but we're only interested in one of the components. Okay, so let's just take a step back and take stock of what we have. We have a complex manifold, SL2C, and we've seen that one possible real form is hyperbolic three space. And another real form is the special unitary group, which is also known as the three sphere. So we have the three sphere and hyperbolic three space as real forms, distinct real forms, of the same complex manifold. Now, in analogy to in Lie theory, where you can derive useful properties on one real form from the other by complexifying and then restricting your attention to one of the real forms, the idea we had was, can we do that for dynamics? So a year or two, two years ago, I was interested in the two body problem on curved spaces. So that was the motivation for this motivation. Let's say it was the two body problem. And it was quite, it was quite nice. And I was able to find some results for the two body problem on the positively curved space so on this, on the three sphere but I struggle to extend those results to the hyperbolic three space. But the hope was that we could somehow get around this problem by complexifying because what is it? We've realized that S3 and H3, both real forms of the same space. So just like the the, the Lie algebraists, can we take the two body problem on the sphere, complexify this to the two body problem on the complex sphere, whatever that means, we'll make that a bit more precise later. And then also consider a different real form, which is the two body problem on hyperbolic space. And my reason for doing this, let me see if I can, can I shrink this? I didn't mean to make it so big. Let's try that one more time. Pinch, squeeze, let go. Excellent, okay. So I, I previously, two years ago, was able to make some progress with the relative equilibrium of the two-body problem on the three-sphere. Uh, this image here is just purely to distract you. It's not going to tell you anything, but it's pretty. It's an example. It's, it's the hop vibration in the three-sphere and these black lines which spiral up and also spiral down the tori is an example of the, the motion of a relative equilibria for the two-body problem on, um, on the three-sphere. Sort of imagine two bodies placed at opposite sides of one of those tori, and they start climbing the tori. 
So that has been done. But the motivation for this is to try and work out what happens in hyperbolic space, which is a bit more confusing. Now, now why might this be a good idea in, in, in the first place? Why should it be more difficult to work out relative equilibria, for example, on hyperbolic space than the spherical space? I mean, as you've just seen, the only difference between the sphere and the hyperboloid is a, is a plus or minus sign. Why can't you just insert minus signs everywhere where they're supposed to appear and all the calculations work out? Well, it doesn't work quite so easily for fairly fundamental reasons. Uh, the symmetry group on the three sphere is SO4. And SO4 conveniently is itself a double cover is, sorry, is itself double covered by two copies of the three sphere. What's happening here is of course, the three sphere is itself a group and left multiplication and right multiplication of the group on itself generate this symmetry. Now this is, this is very handy uh, because it means for the two body problem, our configuration space is itself two copies of the three sphere. And our symmetry group is also two copies of the three sphere. So it's, it's a very nice situation where your configuration space and your symmetry group are both the same. And if we're interested in relative equilibria, we're certainly interested in uh, reducing the problem. And if we have a symmetry group, which is a direct product of two groups, such as this, you can reduce in stages. And it turns out this, this makes finding the relative equilibria uh, very pleasant. So I will give that a green tick. That is a nice situation. However, on the other hand, for hyperbolic through space, the symmetry group is this indefinite orthogonal group, the, the, the Lorentz group. Uh, this is also a, uh, a double, is, is double covered. However, this double cover isn't as useful for us. In particular, this group certainly does not arise as a kind of direct product of two groups in this sense. Um, said differently, hyperbolic three space cannot be given an isometric group structure in the same way that the three sphere can. Um, so this means that the analysis which has previously been done for the three sphere um, cannot be extended directly to an analogous analysis on hyperbolic three space because this, the symmetry fundamentally works differently. So that is why there was initially reason to hope that we could circumvent this by starting off on the, taking the, the two body problem on the three sphere, complexifying it, and then restricting attention. Okay, those words all make sense in English, but how does that actually work mathematically and in practice? So how, how does it work? How does it work? And uh, before seeing how it works in practice, we should see how it works in theory. So brace yourselves for what will probably be the driest part of this talk. Um, okay, let's summon another prop. Um, I'm gonna hit you straight away with a statement, but we will go through it step by step. If you want, you can read it now, but it'd be better to just relax and let's take tackle all of the parts of this statement individually. So the first thing we start off with is with a holomorphic symplectic manifold, which is a complex manifold equipped with a holomorphic two form, which is non-degenerate and closed. It's exactly what you do for a real symplectic manifold, but you just insist that everything is complex and complex differentiable, also known as holomorphic. Um, we call this a holomorphic symplectic manifold. 
Um, what we also have here, so there's holomorphic symplectic manifold. We have a real symplectic structure. Now this real symplectic structure is again an involution. So it satisfies property one from above. It is again conjugate linear. Its derivative is conjugate linear everywhere. I won't write them out again, but that's, that's what they mean. Properties one and two. However, because we are working on a holomorphic symplectic manifold, it makes, it's reasonable to expect that, um, that this involution should respect the symplectic form in some way. So we also require this involution to take the complex value symplectic form and, and take the conjugate of it. Okay, what else is, what else is here? Ah. We suppose that this fixed point set is non-empty. Maybe it's now time to draw a picture actually. So here, here's our complex manifold. We have this involution and we suppose that this involution has a non-empty fixed point set. This is necessarily half dimensional. It's necessarily, well, it's, it's, it's real. And I'm gonna color it in. So if we want dynamics to happen, we need a, we need a Hamiltonian. So the complex valued function F, which is holomorphic, generates a vector field on M. And if we suppose in addition that this function F is purely real on this fixed point set, then the flow generated by this Hamiltonian system preserves the fixed point set and moreover that uh, moreover two important things first of all this fixed point set if you take the holomorphic symplectic form and you restrict it to the fixed point set you get a real symplectic form oops so this this red submanifold here is real symplectic I have a holomorphic function f, which is purely real, and the resulting dynamics preserve that fixed point set. And moreover, those dynamics are in fact hol are Hamiltonian with respect to the real symplectic structure, where the Hamiltonian function in question is the restriction of f, which is by assumption real. Okay, um, that was quite wordy. So in uh, better way of just seeing what I've just said is that this real symplectic manifold, this is a real form. Of this holomorphic Hamiltonian system. If in, in future I say real form, I, I will mostly mean this, but I could also mean all of the other things real form has meant in the last 30 minutes. Okay, that's how the dynamics are induced on, on a um, holomorphic symplectic manifold. If I'm interested in relative equilibria, I ought to talk about um, symmetry. So symmetry should be what you expect. We have a group action on M, which preserves the dynamics. However, it would be reasonable to also expect there to be some degree of compatibility between the symmetry and the real structure R. And the best case scenario is if we have the following. Okay, so here what has been introduced is we have a complex Lie group G which is now acting on M, and we suppose that it preserves the, dy the dynamics. And the complex Lie group G also comes with its own real group structure. Recall that that means it satisfies properties one and two, but it also must be a homomorphism. And it, it has to enjoy this compatibility, this very reasonable compatibility condition. Okay. Now, if such a condition holds, we're actually in a very nice place when it comes to looking for relative equilibrium for the following reason. Let's just for the moment suppose that the action of G is free. 
As it turns out, that is not a necessary assumption, but it makes the exposition easier. And let me draw a typical group orbit. Typically, there's, there's no reason for why the uh, group orbit should be contained inside the fixed point set. So it probably typically looks like this. There we go. So call that G of X and say X is this point here. Here's that intersection. Okay. So what I want to now consider is suppose we have a point in this intersection. So a point here, and let me call it G of X. Okay. Well, G of X is in the intersection, so it's in the fixed point set. So if I apply the involution R, it doesn't do anything. But at the same time, we have this nice compatibility condition above, which tells me that that is rho of G acting on R of X. But X was in the fixed point set, so R of X is simply X. So rho of G acting on X is rho of G. Uh, sorry, R of X is X. But then by freeness, that implies that rho of G is G. So G, is fixed by this real group structure, real, yeah, real structure on the group. What that means is that this intersection between the fixed point set and a group orbit is itself a group orbit of this real Lie group. So perhaps you can see why this might be in, why this might be useful from the perspective of looking for relative equilibria. You shrink that, move that there. Uh, relative equilibria is, is a, a solution. So an, an integral curve of this Hamiltonian vector field, which is contained in a group orbit. Now combine that definition with the theorem above, which says that the uh, fixed point set is invariant under the, under the flow of this Hamiltonian. That means any relative equilibria which starts or intersects this fixed point set has to be contained inside it. But if it's also relative equilibrium, it's contained in a group orbit. So it's therefore inside this intersection here. But that means that this curve is itself, does itself belong to a group orbit of this real Lie group G rho. So that means relative equilibrium in the full complex holomorphic space which passes through this fixed point, those are in a one-to-one -one correspondence with relative equilibria on the real, the real place downstairs. Um, so let's say that more succinctly here. There we go. So here I have a complex holomorphic Hamiltonian system I suppose I have this uh, complex Lie group action G, which is, which is compatible in the sense above. And I also suppose that I have dynamics generated by this holomorphic Hamiltonian F, which is real on the real form. And then I have a one-to-one -one correspondence with those relative equilibria and relative equilibria on the real form. So now you can see how the, how the game plan will proceed. I don't have a lot of time, but we'll try. If we can classify relative equilibria on the three sphere, which we can, we can complexify that to classify them on, in this complex space. And then provided we restrict attention to this real form corresponding to the hyperbolic space, we will have succeeded in classifying the relative equilibria for the two body problem on the hyperbolic space. How much time is left? Three minutes. Sure, let's try it. So that's how it works in theory. How does it work? You have 10 minutes, Finn. 10 minutes? Yeah. I thought it, the last 10 minutes was for questions. Yeah, but it's from 5 to 5, 10, 10 past 5.
You you have ten oh, minutes, but I you can, can stop before if you want. Oh, to. I can I can relax a little bit then. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. No, that's 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 fine. Um. Oh, this feels like a natural pause. If anyone wants to jump in with a question, um. But if not, I'll power on. Okay. How does this work in practice, given given the, the ground we've just covered? Well, our, our we want to define the two body problem on the complex sphere, right? So we take the complex sphere, which we can handily represent as this, as the complex Lie group SL2C. And I should say for the, for the two body problem, of course, what we should be doing is we should take two copies of these things and we should then lift everything to the cotangent bundle. So we have Hamiltonian dynamics properly. I've, I've not mentioned that, and partly because it will make this a bit longer, but also because there's no surprises or everything happens the way you would expect. Um, it suffices to consider just what happens on one sphere, because we're only going to double it to both spheres. And when you lift things to the cotangent bundle, um, everything is as you would expect. Um, cotangent bundles to complex manifolds are holomorphic symplectic manifolds, just as tangent bundles to real manifolds are symplectic manifolds. Um, so there's, there's no surprises there. All we need to do is we need to check that we have these compatible symmetries so that we're able to apply the result above for relative equilibrium. So the symmetry in this case will be left and right multiplication of SL2C on itself. So Here's our, our symmetry group. It's, it's two copies, two direct copies, left and right, acting on the complex three sphere, which we can identify with, with, with the group itself. Pleasingly, this means all the things I said before about reducing in stages because we have a direct product of groups, that all happens exactly like it does with the sphere. So for the spherical situation, our real structure in question is going to, well, we, we've seen it from earlier, from the example before, we simply take the two by two matrix and we look at its inverse conjugate transpose. And we know basically immediately from, from the definition that this fixed point set is the three sphere. Well, it, yes, it's SU2 three sphere. Now to check this compatibility condition, I need to see how uh, this involution respects the group action. So probably good to say this group action up above, let me denote that by a left and right act on Q by left multiplication and right multiplication by the inverse. So if I do just that and then and then compose this with the involution. Uh, what do I get? Some group element acting on R of Q. And um, I'll skip out maybe one or two lines of calculation. You can see that this row is the following involution. And the fixed point set of that is just two copies. But but of course, none of this is surprising because we've 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 um, just found the usual SO4 symmetry on the three sphere. We've just verified that the uh, three sphere is itself with it with its SO4 symmetry is a real form of this complex thing that we've set up. What we really need to check is what happens in the uh, hyperbolic situation. I will, I think it was, yeah, I was, I deliberately chose S before. I just take the um, conjugate transpose. Remember this is a, it's a real structure, but it's not a real group structure anymore. Unlike, unlike the previous case. And recall that we saw that it's fixed point set. 
or at least a, a connected component of it, is hyperbolic three space. And again, we just need to, to check what happens to the group action. So if I do left multiplication followed by right multiplication, and then apply this complex conjugate, um, what do I get? Let's call this involution on the group sigma for aesthetic reasons. And you can see that sigma is going to have to, it's actually a bit more exciting than the previous example, it's gonna swap left and right elements. Twists them. So this fixed point set is a sort of conjugate diagonal copy Oops, where have I gone? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what I'm going to write. I'm just going to try and squeeze a C in there. There you go. Um, I have a, this, this copy of SL2C sort of sits in a kind of conjugate diagonal. And pleasingly, this is exactly one way of seeing the double cover of the symmetry group here for hyperbolic three space. So, Again, to take a step back to assess what we've what we've done so far, is we've taken the three sphere with its SO4 symmetry, complexified everything, and checked that the real form corresponding to the hyperbolic three space satisfies this um, equivariant condition. So we're 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 good to go. Really, we're good to apply this proposition at the end of the page. The only thing that's missing, which um, I've not told you about because, again, it's it's like what I said before. It's, it's it's something where there are no surprises. Is I've not introduced the Hamiltonian. Um, but you 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 put the Hamiltonian on, and you get your flow, and sure enough, you're in a position where you can apply this final proposition, and you can realize the ambition, Marine and I had last year. You can take a known result such as a classification of relative equilibria on the three sphere for the two body problem complexify it, restrict attention to the hyperbolic real form. And sure enough, using the exact same methods as are used to find out the relative equilibria of the spherical problem, you get the relative equilibria for the two body problem on the hyperbolic three space. This is the ball model of hyperbolic three space. And this, like the, the picture before of the hop vibration, just shows you uh, typical, uh, yeah, what the uh, orbits of one parameter subgroups look like. So you can imagine you might put one of your, generically we have these loxodromic transformations, you might put one planet here and another planet on the other side, and you have this nice generic spiraling uh, motion. Yeah, sadly, this strange parabolic relative equilibria is not realized for strictly attractive potentials, it turns out. Um, and what are a few of the last things I want to say? So um, obviously I've disguised from you the actual details of these relative equilibria, calculating them and finding out exactly where they are. But I stress, trust me, you, you really do exactly what I've just said before. You do it for the three sphere, complexify it, and then restrict the, the appropriate hyperbolic real form. Um, okay, some scope for just some concluding remarks. These are not the only real forms. Um, there are more, there are others. Um, some of them can be quite interesting as well. So how much time? Three minutes. Yeah, let's go for it. More exotic. Real forms. Uh, we are looking at the two body problem. So really our configuration space is is two copies of the complex three sphere. So, so far our real structures have just been the direct product of the real structure on one space and the real structure on the other. There's no reason why you can't um, RSTU. You could take the 
two of these bodies and, and you could twist them. And now you're just like we saw for the previous example, your real form fix you uh, will be a kind of twisted diagonal copy. This is our real form, SL2C. And the, the example I've just drawn here, U, is um, also compatible with respect to the group action. And the resulting group action you will have on this is, is SU2 cross SU2 acting on the left and right. Um, now, if, if anyone has encountered, um, for instance, Riemannian ellipsoids before, um, uh, Riemannian ellipsoid, this is, I'm going very quickly now, but, but you might have to be interested in, in a configuration space of all possible states of a blob of self-gravitating fluid. And obviously that's far too complicated. So you only look at small linear disturbances to the fluid. So your configuration is given by SL3R, but your symmetry, you can, it shouldn't make a difference if you just rotate how you look at this blob of fluid. And the same can also be said as if you live inside the blob of fluid, um, it shouldn't make a difference if you live inside, if you rotate. So um, this is a very different dynamical system, of course, to the two body problem. This is what we call a Riemannian ellipsoid but it's kind of complex analog is, is an example of a more exotic real form for the, for the two body problem. Um, so yeah, just, just in case you thought all this do, did was deal with dynamics on uh, the sphere and the hyperbolic space, you, you get more real forms, it's richer than that. So I think I'll end there for, I'm on the hour. Well, thank you very much, Phil, very nice talk. Anybody wants to ask something? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Lewis. Hi, very nice talk. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, I'm confused about something, though. You said you get uh, H3 by taking the fixed set of a certain real map, and then you showed a nice equation that defines a hyperboloid, right? Yes. But then uh, you should say something about a metric that is also being restricted, right? Because I mean, that thing is a H3 provided you restrict the Minkowski metric in R4 in this case. Yeah. So my uh, resistance to talking about a metric is included in my resistance to explicitly telling you what the Hamiltonian F is. Um, so you're absolutely right. We obviously, to have dynamics, we need to have a metric on these things. And that metric will be contained in the Hamiltonian. Um, some comments about that. The, the, the term in the Hamiltonian for the metric will be exactly what you expect it to be. It's, um, you know, something that looks like, something that looks like that, but for the, um, uh, for the co-vectors instead of the position vectors. Um, and this will, you can, you can see that if we restrict attention to the, the three sphere, where this kind of is this a signature of the resulting real metric, we will get the Euclidean metric on the sphere. However, there's a slight caveat on the hyperbolic space because the metric on the hyperbolic hyperboloid is, is not strictly the, the restriction of this ambient Minkowski metric. It's, it's annoyingly, it's the negative, um, which, which is a bit strange. So it means if you, if you actually, if you were to, if you were able to see this complex picture, you would see the th three, the two body problem on the three sphere moving sort of forward in time, but the two body problem on the hyperbolic space is kind of moving uh, backwards because it's got negative kinetic energy. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hiding the kinetic energy in the Hamiltonian, which I've not shown. Yeah. Uh, um, Luis is here. Okay. Uh, is there another question? 
Yeah, I was in, I was intrigued by your last comment about the Riemann ellipsoids. Yeah. Because there's a very rich, well, Riemann produced a very rich classification of relative equilibria um, for this problem. And uh, how does that translate? I mean, I can't remember it, the details anymore, but type one and type two and... Uh, yeah, I, I, I also don't... Regions of momentum space. But of course, there was a, there was a complicated self-gravitational potential energy, but the geometry was uh, was uh, already interesting without knowing the potential. Yes, I mean, I, I also don't know the details. I know, um, I mean, it seems very impressive that Riemann was able to to do this before, you know, Absolutely. we even talked about relative equilibria and Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, but but I, I can draw a slight analogy. So, so our, um, our Hamiltonian will, of course, consist of, of kinetic energy of, of the fluid moving and a sort of, as you say, kind of complicated gravitational potential energy, which should nevertheless be invariant under this left and right um, body symmetry. Sure. Um, so, so you have this expression for what the Hamiltonian lo should look like, kinetic energy and potential energy. If you um, trace the terms of that Hamiltonian through uh, in this picture for the, for the real form, um, then that uh, kinetic energy, or let's start with the pot potential energy, that potential energy, which is both left and right invariant under, under this group action, uh, corresponds to the potential energy between two bodies when I lift to this complex two-body problem. Um, and in some sense, that's not surprising because the symmetry also lifts. And if you've got that much symmetry, there's kind of only, um, what do I mean? Uh, there's only one invariant, yeah. right? The distance between the two bodies. So that potential energy of the fluid corresponds to a potential energy, a function of the distance between the two bodies. The, the kinetic energy on the other hand, um, when you complexify and then restrict attention to this, this real form, this real form is six dimensional and there's no guarantee why uh, kinetic energy when you if you complexify all the variables and then restrict to a real form there's no reason why that should be positive definite anymore so what actually happens this this kind of complex version of a Riemann ellipsoid which I've circled in red the kinetic energy is of signature um, kind of three three on SL2C so it's not a very um, physically realistic thing that you get but you know, it's, it's SL2C, which is already not very real. But that, that's for the holomorphic system. Yeah. Well, uh, n no, oh, I, so, so, yeah, con confusing. Here, SL2C is understood as a real form. Oh, right. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, if, yeah. I, if I just draw that uh, card, cartoon picture again here, this, this complex manifold is actually three co two copies, sorry. Mm -hmm. And here's this strange twisted diagonal. And right. um, and yeah, if you if you if you take the two body problem, which is also somewhere here, complexify and then restrict attention. Well, I should say I think the masses have to be equal for this to work as well. Um, and you restrict your attention to this real form, you will get a kind of Riemannian ellipsoid problem, but where the kinetic energy is of signature. Three, three. So not very realistic, but it's there. Yeah, so equal mass. So there's in the Riemann ellipsoid problem, there's, a, there's an involution. Which, I am the transpose. Taking the transpose, which was amazingly discovered by uh, Dedekin. Uh, right. Because you, they didn't have matrices, so they didn't have transposes. It's just written in nine coordinates. Somebody opened the textbook 90 degrees out of phase. Yeah. So, he, so uh, yeah, so that must be swapping the bodies over. Oh, I see. see. You're, you're one step ahead of me. You're thinking how that appears on the other real form. Yeah. No, you, you, I'm you, just you, suggesting that's why you need equal masses. You're right. Yeah. No, I like that idea. Um, what would happen if, if, if you didn't have 
if you had non-equal masses, what would go wrong is when you complexify everything, you might recall that this holomorphic Hamiltonian has to be real on a real form. Uh -huh. And uh, you need the masses to be just right in order to ensure that you don't get any imaginary parts appearing. Uh -huh. um, um, yeah. uh, is there another question? Yeah, maybe if, if there's time. Um, yeah, so, no. yeah, just a vague question somehow. Um, so the, the middle part of your talk um, was quite general, right? So I just wondered if there are other nice examples of, of two systems, of two classical systems maybe, which complexify to the same thing, or if um, you only applied it to this, to this yeah, case. Yeah, uh, there is actually, there is, there is, the, the, the real motivation that Maureen and I had actually for this was um, we were looking at the Kepler problem and um, you know how on earth should any of what I've just said apply to the Kepler problem? Well, the Kepler problem has um, some additional symmetry. Here is, um, here is, a, is a, a structure matrix for the Kepler problem on the plane. Where you can H is the Hamiltonian, you can ignore that. But um, L is angular momentum. And I don't know if maybe it's not terribly well known, but A1 and A2 are these extra hidden symmetries. They call it the Laplace Runge lens vector. Uh, Runge lens vector, let's say. And uh, you, you notice that if I set, I think that should be. Yeah, that's the correct sign. If I set h to be uh, minus one or h to be plus one, this uh, structure matrix between the integrals, if I zoom all the way to the first page, you'll notice that the sign of h determines one of these two Lie algebras. So this is nice, but it's also a bit inconvenient because it means the, the symmetry of uh, the full symmetry of the Kepler problem depends on the Hamiltonian. When the Hamiltonian is negative, you get SO3. But the group of symmetries, the infinitesimal group of symmetries changes when the Hamiltonian changes. So um, uh, one example where this is a like a sort of non-trivial trivial instance of real forms is if you take the Kepler problem and you complexify everything, this kind of sign change disappears. Um, so um, mm -hmm. the, the, the Kepler problem for, for negative energy and positive energy are both themselves kind of kind of like live on the same real form in, in, in a complexified Kepler problem. Um, there are more examples as well. I mean, um, uh, this very quickly now, um, here's the sphere and you, you might want to consider vortices on the sphere. Um, that's obviously very well understood. You might also instead want to consider vortices on the uh, on, on, a, on the hy hyperbolic space. Mm -hmm. um, but you could you could also by complexifying things and choosing the right real form, you you will also get you could look at vortices on on this resulting kind of cylinder, which is neither. different to the other two cases above, but again, it appears as a, as a real form of what happens when you complexify everything. Mm. Uh, there even, even more, ex uh, sorry, yeah, go on. No, no, I just said it was very nice. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, there, there, there's a, there, that happened with an indefinite metric. Yeah, good point, James. So, so yeah, exactly. So the metric on the sphere is plus plus. Uh, the metric on the hyperboloid is also, uh, is also plus plus, but, in this case, it turns out when you complexify and everything and restrict to the real form, this metric will be plus minus. It's a similar caveat to what I mentioned before with the um, Riemannian ellipsoid, where you don't get a realistic kinetic energy, you get an indefinite signature for the kinetic, for, for, for the Riemannian metric, plus three, minus three, here you get plus minus, but it still makes sense. It still gives you a, a real form in the sense described above. And perhaps the last thing I'd like to sell is there's, a, there's another example of this. If you take the spherical pendulum, 
as a real Hamiltonian mm -hmm. system. You can complexify that. And remarkably, a real form which sits inside here is two copies of the two sphere, which is compact. So if, mm -hmm. if you uh, didn't agree with me at the very start when I said that this was somewhat analogous to the unitary trick, you can actually take the integrable system for the spherical pendulum, complexify it, and find inside that a comp compact real form. And here's, here's the picture that you would get if you're interested in, the, in, in that as an integrable system. On the left, we have the um, spherical pendulum. And if I look at this compact real form, you get this nice teardrop on the right. Mm. So yeah, it's more than just spheres and hyper, per, hyperboloids. Mm. Yeah, that last example seems very interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. Somehow in, in, in symplectic topology, those two spaces are also, they always appear uh, kind of in, in, in a pair, right? This uh, T star S2 and S2 times S2. Sometimes you can transport one construction to the other and vice versa. So this looks... That sounds nice. Uh, th this I, has... I should look into ah, it. <laughs> yeah, the cotangent is an imaginary real form. So it's another case of real form. It, yeah. It, yeah, it is itself a real form of the complexified. Yeah, yeah in, in, in a way, in a way, it's in kind of way. just as you can define real forms, you can also have an imaginary form. So the to be completely accurate, it's an imaginary form, but it it, it does the same thing. Um, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and it's very curious. This this final result actually requires hypercalar geometry to prove. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, maybe we can uh, stop here because Carlos.